join uh, the study. This is the second time we went through, um, and actually all these notes are uh, on our church website, well, they used to be, hopefully they're still there, uh, under Genesis, if you go to the folder on Genesis, and the messages should be in there, and there's PDFs of all of these uh, outlines that we put together. We taught it on our Sunday school uh, probably about, oh, I don't know, probably six or seven years ago. And uh, tonight we're in Genesis chapter 46, so if you turn there, please. And the title of the message this evening is Jacob's Journey to Joseph. And what we've been doing, of course, in our study in Genesis is, is really just taking one chapter uh, for each lesson. And sometimes that's very challenging. I think one night we did like 73 verses in three different chapters as, as we continued the story. Um, but in chapter uh, 46, we have 34 verses, and we're just going to read it as we go through, kind of like we do on, on Wednesday night. But let's start with the first seven verses. And you notice in your outline there, this is Jacob's faith uh, in verses 1 through uh, verse number 7. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt. Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. Now, Father, we thank you for this good day. We have enjoyed the fellowship of your people and around thy precious word. We're grateful, Lord, for the hope that we have in Christ. This world has no idea what, uh, uh, what the right path is. They, they don't know how to solve uh, the problems that we face. But, Lord, one day Jesus will come and make everything right. And, Lord, we long for you and we look for you and we love your appearing. And we ask, and as the Apostle John, even so come, Lord Jesus. But, Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We want to be students of your word. And help us, Lord, in our study in Genesis as we consider now this happy time, this good day for Jacob when he gets to go down to meet Joseph after 22 years. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to understand this chapter and help us to be able to apply it to our lives. Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for your grace to us. We don't deserve you, Lord. We don't deserve your mercy. We don't deserve your smile. We don't deserve your kindness. But, Lord, you're all those things to us, and we're grateful tonight. We ask for your presence to be manifest with us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, this journey, and this is the journey, Jacob's journey to Joseph, and it would begin an experience that would last for 430 years. This is, of course, when the children of Israel are going to go down now into Egypt, and they're going to stay there for 430 years. In fact, that was uh, prophesied to Abraham. I think it was in Genesis chapter 15, God told him that. Well, they would be there. And the reason he said it was because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. And so when Israel comes out of Egypt and going into the promised land, it's going to be a judgment through Joshua on uh, the Canaanite nations. And so it's very interesting when you think about that 430 years in Egypt. Of course, it starts out good because the Pharaoh knew Joseph and Jacob and all of his brethren. And they were very well treated at the beginning. Joseph, of course, making sure that that would happen. But then the Pharaoh dies and there's other Pharaohs that come along that knew not Joseph. And so things get increasingly bad. So that the point when Moses is born, they're taking all the baby boys, throwing them into the river and drowning them all. So a genocide, really. And so it was a mixed bag, really. But 430 years is this time when really God is forming a nation. And there, you'll see in our, our scripture today, 70 of them go down. And there's probably about 2 million of them that come out later on, 430 years later on. And it's an interesting story because at the beginning of that period of time and the end of that period of time, there's two very special people. And I know that you're sick hearing me talk about them, but they're very, it's very, very important. You can tell me who they are, can't you? Okay, the first one is Joseph, and the second one is Moses. 
Right, amen. Brother, brother Mike's got it. <laughs> I mean, you ought to have been preaching on it for like a year. Um, now, there is a place in the New Testament and there is, a, there is a preacher in the New Testament who highlights those two characters. Anybody tell me who that is? Stephen. Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And it's the sermon that gets him stoned. Okay. So now the thing is, and we've laboured the point, that Joseph and Moses are very much alike. And they're really patterns for the Lord Jesus. Joseph's relationship to Israel and Moses' relationship to Israel patterns Jesus' relationship to Israel. And that's really the point that Stephen was making. And he kind of brought the message home to his critics when he said, uh, you know, you men of Israel, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And the point was that when Joseph came into this world, he was the favoured son of his father, but he was hated by his brethren. He was sold by Judah for pieces of silver uh, into Egypt. So he came unto his own, as it were, and his own received him not. And so Joseph had to go into the far country. And while he's in the far country, he marries a Gentile bride. Her name is Asenath. She's, married, uh, she's mentioned in this chapter. And then, uh, and of course, we're in this story. And it's been a wonderful story because uh, they came to Egypt looking for sustenance. And Joseph knew who they were, but they didn't know who he was. Just like when Jesus came, he said, you know not the day of your visitation. He knew, obviously, who they were. But they had no idea, really, that Jesus was the true Messiah. Now, some they should have known because the evidence was there. Uh, but he was not revealed to them, really, at that point. And so, uh, Joseph, and this is Stephen's message, was that the second time that, that they came down, Joseph was revealed. But that was only after the repentance of Judah, the one who sold him. And, of course, it's interesting that Judah and Judas is the same name. Judas is the Greek name for Judah. And Jesus also was sold by Judah, or Judas, for pieces of silver. And Jesus, of course, goes into the far country. That's where he is right now. He's been married to a Gentile bride. Basically, the church, for the most part, although the church, early church was all Jewish, for the last 2,000 years, primarily, it's been a Gentile bride. And um, so, Israel, uh, Joseph was revealed to his brethren the second time. And the important thing is Joseph became their deliverer. He was the one that fed them, protected them. As you're going to see here, he's going to take care of his brothers. The ones that rejected him, he's going to deliver them. Same thing happens with Jesus. The Jewish people have rejected Jesus and he has set them aside for a period of time. He's doing something from the far country. He's been received by the Gentiles, just as Joseph was received by the Gentiles. But when Jesus comes back the second time, he will indeed be received by the Jewish people. The ones that rejected him are the ones that are going to receive him. That's not the church. You can't get the church in there. The church is the Gentile bride. You see, that's where we fit into the pattern. But Jesus will be received by the Jewish people and he will become their deliverer. Because the Antichrist is coming against Israel to, 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 just to decimate them. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 14, you know, half the city of Jerusalem is rightly taken. And then they lift up their heads for the redemption draws nigh. They hear the sound of the, the, the cavalry, which is the host of heaven. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord is coming, riding upon white horses, and we're following with them. And he delivers Israel. He defeats them with a sword that proceeds, proceeds out of his mouth. He destroys his enemies by the breath of his lips, Isaiah says. And he delivers them. And then it's a happy time afterwards, just as, as it is a happy time for Jacob after this reunion here. So that's Joseph at the beginning. And then you have Moses at the end. These are kind of like bookends. And you ought to, you ought to study that out because there are bookends in Scripture. For example, when Jesus started his ministry, he cleansed the temple at the beginning, he cleansed the temple at the end. There was a man at the beginning of Jesus' ministry called John. There was a man at the end of Jesus' ministry, the book of Revelation. And there are two different Johns, John the Baptist and John the Apostle. There was a woman by the name of Mary who anointed his feet with, uh, with oil, with uh, ointment, uh, in the house of Simon. Um, and there was a woman called Mary who was in the house of Simon who anointed his feet with uh, ointment at the end of his ministry. Two different Marys. Two different Simons, two different places, two different times. They're like bookends. I personally believe that the battle of Gog and Magog will happen before the tribulation. I think that's the thing that sets it up for the Antichrist to make this covenant and this... It's, people talk about a peace treaty, but it's actually a, a, a promise and a covenant and an alliance for the children of Israel to rebuild the temple and to start a, a new sacrificial system on the Temple Mount, which is impossible now because of Islam. 
But because of the, Gog, the battle of Gog and Magog, um, that negates all of that. And I think that's, that happens at the beginning of the tribulation. And then, of course, there is a battle at the end of the tribulation called the battle of Armageddon. Again, bookends. And so Joseph and Moses are bookends. And it's the same thing with Moses. Moses, uh, when he was 40 years old, came. And you remember he defended uh, the Hebrew against the Egyptian. He slew the Egyptian. And the next day he comes out, two Hebrews are fighting. He tries to sort them out. And one of the Hebrews says, what, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And, and, the, and the Hebrews said to him, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Who do you think you are? And Moses realized that it was, they, were, they were rejecting him. It says in Acts chapter 7, he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God had sent him to deliver them from Egypt, but they understood not. Later on in that chapter, he says um, that the Lord your God will raise up one of you. A prophet like unto me, him shall you hear. So there was, there was going to be a prophet in Israel's future that would just be like Moses. And of course, that was Jesus. And the thing about it was, it says, him shall you hear. And they didn't hear when he came the first time. Which necessitates him coming the second time so that they will hear him. And they will hear him the second time. Well, the same thing with Moses. Once he was rejected by his own, he had to go away. He went into the far country, in the land of Midian. What did he do? He married a Gentile brain called Zipporah. And after 40 years, he went to the burning bush. He took off his shoes. God said, I'm sending you back, Moses. And he gave Moses signs and wonders. And Moses went back to Egypt. They went to his people, the Hebrews. And they received him after he demonstrated the signs. Now, there, there, there's patterns in there. That with Joseph, as repentance had to happen with Israel. And Joseph set it up so that uh, they had to live it over again. They got it wrong with Joseph, but they got it right with Benjamin. And so they weren't going to put their daddy through that again. And so there was genuine repentance from Judah. And that's when he was revealed. Same thing with Israel in the tribulation period. Part of the purpose of the tri tribulation period is for them to repent. And they will repent. But on Moses' side, there were signs and wonders that he did. Uh, God says, you know, Moses didn't even want to go. And the Lord gave him signs. He said, that, what's that in your hand? A staff. Throw it down. It became a snake. Go lift it. It became, became a staff again. I mean, that's pretty supernatural. He says, put your hand in your, your pocket. Bring it out. It was leprous. White as snow. Put it back in again. Brought it out. It was clean. These are the, he took water, spilled it on the ground, became like blood. These are signs that he did before Israel. In the tribulation period, there will be signs and wonders. And God is going to make himself known. It's the day of the Lord and he's going to speak. And he's going to do supernatural things to get his people's attention. And I think that's really what Gog and Magog is all, all about. In Ezekiel 30 and 39. The reason, one of the reasons God does that is so that his people from that day and forward will know that he is the Lord. They're gone. Because most of the Jewish people don't even believe in God. Do you know them? They're atheistic. They're agnostic. If you, if you study it out, the, the, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, only 26% of them go to a synagogue on Sabbath. They're a secular people. And how are you going to get them to believe in Jesus at the end of the tribulation if they don't believe in God right now? So God has to do something. And that ties in with the Feast of Trumpets. With you, with, when you study it out historically, it has to do with uh, revival, religious revival among the Jewish people, and in particular to the sacrificial system. The Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month, and that is when uh, Zerubbabel went back with Ezra to, uh, to build a temple, but before they even built the temple, they built an altar. And they sacrificed on the first day of the seventh month, and that was the fe that's when the Feast of Trumpets is all about. And so I believe after the Battle of Gog and Magog, and that uh, Temple Mount area, that shrine, the golden shrine of the Muslims is going to be knocked down. In Ezekiel 38, it says that every wall in Jerusalem will fall flat. But God is going to demonstrate supernaturally with fire from heaven, which we haven't seen from, since biblical times, that he exists. And they will know that there is a Lord God in heaven, and he is the God of Israel who defended them and protected them. And then he's going to work repentance um, in the land of Israel so that when Jesus comes they will lift up their heads and they will say Hosanna blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord but just, just as with Joseph uh, Moses is in the far country he marries a Gentile bride Zipporah Gentile Midianite and um, then when he comes to Israel the second time then he will be received now that's there's a lot of truth in that chapter for someone who is not a premillennialist, someone who believes that the church is israel and that there's no future for national israel that's a real problem because the people who will receive jesus are the ones that rejected jesus the church has never rejected jesus the jewish people have rejected jesus 
And that's the thing that's going to turn. And that's the pattern that Joseph sets up. That's the pattern that Moses sets up. And these are bookends at the beginning of Egypt and at the end of Egypt. It's pretty clear, isn't it? I think so. I think it's a strong argument for premillennial truth. All right, well, um, we won't turn there, but Genesis 15, God foretold Abraham of this time, this 430 years in Egypt. Now, the first seven verses, this is Jacob's faith, and uh, this is a very exciting part of the story because if it's all been doom and gloom, um, it's interesting what, what J Jacob says to the Pharaoh over in chapter 47. Jacob said on the furrow that the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of uh, the years of my life been. I told you that Jacob was one of the sorriest lives in the whole Bible. It's one of the, the most painful and rockiest roads. Uh, strife in the home when he was growing up. Strife, having four wives and all the competition was going on. And then Rachel dying and Joseph and his mind dying. Uh, it was a, just a terrible Many, many painful things for, for Jacob. But now here's a good part of the story. He's heard and seen evidence that Joseph is alive in chapter 45. And in verse 28, and Israel said, it is enough. I've seen enough evidence. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. What a happy day. It's interesting that before that, his name was Jacob. Jacob, Jacob. Even though God changed Israel years ago, but they kept calling him Jacob until he got this revived spirit. And they called him Israel. And so when we start 46, and Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba. You see, that's where, uh, that's where his father, Abraham, that was his home. And his, his father, Isaac, that's where they, the, the word beer means well, Sheba, oath, the well of the oath, Beersheba. Or as they say around here, Beersheba. Okay, same thing. And what did he do there? He offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. I wonder what he offered. You know, he got a lot of stuff from Egypt, didn't he? Jacob sent them all this stuff on 10 donkeys, 10 male donkeys, then 10, 10 female donkeys full of travel snacks <laughs> of all the good. I wonder, remember what he promised back in chapter 28, of all that thou givest me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. It wouldn't surprise me if he opened those sacks up and took 10% of that and put it on an altar and burned it as a burnt offering. Burnt offering is completely consumed. Can't use any of it. And he gave a 10% offering unto the Lord because that's what he always did. And really that's why Joseph was there taking care of him. You see, of all that thou givest me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. He was a worshiper of God. And I think he was in that covenant with the Lord where the Lord says, okay, and I will take care of you. And I know a famine's coming, so here's what I'm going to do. 22 years before, I'm going to send your son and I'm going to set it up where he's going to be in control of all the food in all the world. And so God fed Jacob. But there was a problem, you see, because his, his father and his grandfather went down to Egypt uh, without the permission of the Lord. And when they went down there, they made a mess of things, didn't they? And, you know, both, you know, Abraham had to come back to Bethel. He had to come back to the place where God had told him to be. And so this was important that, uh, that Jacob checked this out with the Lord. And that's why he goes to Beersheba. And that's why he makes the sacrifice. He's, he's seeking God. And then in verse 2, God responds. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am the God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee. And that's all you need to hear right there. Yes. Lord, wherever I go, you need to go with me. Because if you're not going, I'm not going. That's really what the, that, that should be the principle of our lives. You know, many times we make decisions and God's not, even, not, not included in the decision. That's always a mistake. Even if you think it's the right thing, we really always should consult the Lord and uh, be obedient to the principles of Scripture. Always honor the Lord in all those decisions. Put God first in all of our lives. And Jacob was smart enough at this point in his life where he was going to do that. And so he, he sacrificed and he consulted the Lord. And so the Lord was basically saying, okie dokie, it's okay to go down there. And he says, I'm going to do a wonderful uh, work while you are there um, in Egypt. And so God spoke to assure Jacob, you know, when you're going through hard times, I mean, it's hard, life's hard enough. But if you, know, if you don't know you're in the will of God, that really, really makes it hard. Um, and so, if you know this is where God would have you, if you have an assurance that this is where God has you, then you can put up with all kinds of stuff as long as you know that you're in the will of God. 
But if you're not in the will of God, even if things are not really that difficult, it's always a misery. It's always like, you know, are you really sure? And so it's important that we seek the face of God in all those decisions. And so God promised that they would come back into the land of promise. And he also promised that Joseph would outlive uh, Jacob because it says that, um, he says that, uh, that Joseph will put his hand upon your eyes. In other words, uh, that's Jacob's going to die and Joseph would close his eyes in death. Which is kind of, now we think, oh, well, that's terrible, isn't it? No, it, for him, that's really good because he thought Joseph was already dead. He says, no, Joseph's going to outlive live you. And that's, that's a good thing. Uh, maybe at this point, I would like to just point out, if you just turn over your seat for just a moment, I think this is something that, that's helpful. And, <clears throat> and, and really, there, there's, there's certain scriptures, like Genesis 47, verse 9, uh, where Jacob comes before Pharaoh, which is, you know, right here. And he says, that, that's, that's over in chapter 30, I just read a moment ago, chapter 47, verse number 9. He says that, that the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. So, well, so when Jacob comes down at this point, he's 130 years old. So that, now from that, from that figure, you can, you can estimate some other things. So if you look at your chart there on the back of your notes, if you start at that 130, we know that um, there, was, there, was, uh, there was two years of famine when this happened. So he comes down to Joseph after the two years of famine. Before that, there were seven years of plenty. So that's nine years. And when Joseph came before Pharaoh, the Bible says, you have it there in, in your notes, Genesis 41 verse 46, it says that Joseph was, was 30 years old. So that means when his daddy came down, he was 39. Now, if you back this up, uh, and so there's a way you basically reverse engineer it from the, uh, the 130 uh, year old date. Uh, but when you take it all the way back, do you know how old Jacob was when he left home, when he was doing all this trickery with his daddy? And old Esau's out getting the venison, and he says, I'm Esau, your son, and he puts the goat skins on. We always think he's just a young fellow, right? He's 77 years old. When he leaves home, when he's at Bethel, and he, he, he sees the ladder stretched up in the heaven, and he establishes his own relationship with God, so he's now the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's 77 years old. He's 77 years old when he starts working for his wives. He works seven years, and then he gets married to Leah and then Rachel. And he works 14 years for his wives. And that's when, the end of the 14 years is when Joseph is born. It tells you that in Genesis chapter 30. And so then he works another six years for the sheep. So anyway, so when, 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 when Joseph is born, uh, Jacob is 91. When Joseph leaves home, or well, when he's sold into slavery, it tells you that he's 17 years old when that happens. So that means that Jacob is 108 and Joseph is 17. Um, and so he's 39 when Jacob he gets to see his daddy here. Um, and of course, his, his daddy thinks, you know, let me see Joseph and then I'll die. In fact, he says the same thing to Joseph here in just a moment. Uh, but of course, he doesn't die. There's another 17 years. He's 130, but he lives 100, another 17 years. He dies at 147 when Joseph is 56 years old. And Joseph himself lives to 110. 147 is pretty old, isn't it? And yet he says, my years, when he said 130, he says, I haven't reached the, the age of my, my fathers, you know. And of course, I think uh, Abraham lived to 160, or maybe that was, that might have been his father Isaac. But they were, they were older, but, you know, it, it just tends you to think, we're, we'll talk about this later on, that, you know, there, there's not too much time um, after the flood. Uh, you know, before the flood, they were living, like Methuselah was 969 years. And even after the flood, they lived, some of these guys were contemporary with one another. And a lot of this history was passed down by word of mouth. But anyway, I think that's interesting, that little timeline there, just to help you to see, you know, how old both of them were at these particular junctures in their lives. All right, let's go to point number two, Jacob's family. I really don't want to, you know, take the time to read through the genealogies. We're kind of not into that, but... Um, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> and we'll read the notes too. So, and these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. Uh, Reuben, I, when, when Joseph was sold into slavery, I estimate Ju Reuben's name about, th or age about 31. He was the oldest. So these guys were all in their 30s and, and their 20s, you know. Um, so there's Reuben. 
Uh, then he gives all the sons. So he's given the family tree. Get Reuben, the oldest. And then he gives his sons, some of the grandsons too, possibly. Hanak and Phaluel and Hezron and Carmi. And the sons of Simeon, uh, Jemuel and Jamin and Hoda. Hoha, this is, this is going to be the neighbor, and Jashan and Zoar and Shaul, the son of a Canaanitish woman. Now, this is the only time where he kind of departs and sticks something in. Now, the first four sons of Jacob were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And Simeon and Levi were two peas in a pod, and they were bad guys. They, had, they, had, they were cruel. They were the ones that killed uh, Shechem. And the whole village, and they, these, and later on, Jacob says they have creel. Uh, he says they don't even want to know the creel inventions that they have in their houses. And uh, so Simeon, I think, remember Simeon was the one that Joseph kept in jail. Why did he do that? I think Simeon was the one that said, let's kill him. And there were special lessons that Joseph had for Simeon. But also, as he writes down here, he, he mentions this bad thing. For them to, to marry a Canaanite woman was not a good thing. Now somebody else met, married a Canaanite woman, and his name is Judah. And of course, I mean all all the all the things that happened with with Judah was disaster. You remember he had he had two sons by his daughter-in-law. Do you remember that story? It was very unsavory altogether. But you know what's interesting when you read through here, he mentions the sin or this this negative thing about Simeon. Then he talks about Levi, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Mirai. And the sons of, then it says the sons of Judah, Ur, and Onam. And both those guys died. See, Judah robbed Jacob of Joseph, but Judah got robbed of two sons because of their, their wickedness. And then Shelah was the third. And that was the one he, he, he didn't marry off to his daughter-in-law. And so Phares and Zerah, these are the sons of Jacob, or sorry, Judah with uh, uh, the, the daughter-in-law. And he says, But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Pharaohs were Herzon and Ham. You know, he didn't even mention that. I would have thought, as wicked and as bad as, uh, as Judah was, and basically, uh, and he thought she was a prostitute, uh, going with his daughter-in-law, and of course we know the story, she did that because, um, you know, she wanted to have children, and uh, he was going to burn her. And she says, well, this is the signet and this is the staff who, you know, discern who these are. And he says, oh my goodness, she's more righteous than I am. That was pretty serious. I would have thought, in my opinion, that would have been more serious than just marrying a Canaanite woman. Which he also did. And you know what? It's not mentioned at all here. Not mentioned at all. And when you get to Genesis 49, which we may get to in a moment... Um, when Jacob is talking about Reuben, he remembers that Reuben lay with um, Bilha, I think it was, one of his concubines, and, um, and nothing was said about it at the time. Jacob never forgot him. And he says, you will not prosper. And then he talks about the cruelty of Simeon and Levi. And so Reuben's negative, Simeon and Levi's negative, gets to Judah. Not one negative thing said about him. It's all happy days. In fact, Judah becomes one of his favorites. And you're thinking, well, how come Judah got away with it? Well, he didn't get away with it. You know what Judah did? He repented. He repented. And when he repented, then he says, Joseph says, I'm your brother Joseph. And he revealed himself. You see, repentance is so important. And the point is, when Judah repented, it basically God took care of it. They were genuinely sorry. And of course, Judah was representing all the brothers. But Judah himself was repentant for the wrong that he had done, fessed up and got right with God. And because of that, the sin was never brought to, to mind again. I think that's a wonderful thing. Because, friend, when you repent and believe upon Jesus Christ as your Savior and you get saved, and you're thinking, oh, the, the regret I have in my life, let me tell you something, it will never be mentioned to you. Jesus bore all that shame for you. And the only thing that God has for you is blessing. That's an amazing thing. He doesn't even mention it. So then... In verse 13, the sons of Issachar, Tola, Fu, uh, Fufa, <laughs> Fufa, <laughs> my goodness, I see you laugh. Uh, Fufa, and then, look at this, Job and Simron. Now, we don't really know. There is a, uh, when it talks about the land of Uz, that actually goes back to like Edom and Esau. Um, but it's kind of interesting, there's a guy called Job here, and I, I don't think it's the Job of the Bible, Job. I don't know for sure, but it's interesting that the name was still around, you know. So it was back in the very early days of, of Genesis, okay. All right, um, 
Verse 14, And the sons of Zabulon, Zarad, Elon, Jalil, these be the sons of Leah, which he bore unto Jacob in Padan Aram, uh, with his daughter Dinah. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were 30 and 3. Now he's going he's to count these up, and if you notice your notes there, this is the list of Jacob's family that he's going to bring down into Egypt. And so he's totaling it all up. And so this is the list of Jacob's family, with the exception of the daughters-in-law. It doesn't mention the, the daughters-in-law. and really doesn't mention the daughters either. It doesn't mention the, the daughters. The only daughters mentioned is his own daughter, which is Dinah. But his granddaughters are not mentioned. There had to be some. In fact, he mentions that there was granddaughters, or there were daughters there, the daughters of his sons. But they, they're, not, they're not counted in, in the list, okay? Um, so he begins with the sons of Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zabulon, and Dinah. So those are the sons of uh, Leah, 33. Then the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad, and Asher, total 16. So it's not just the, the sons, it also includes, obviously, the grandsons here as well. Then the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, total 14. By the way, it's interesting there, Dan had the fewest number of sons, one. He had one son. Do you know how many sons that... Um, that Benjamin had? Ten. That's why I said to you when they, they talk about the lad, you know, we, we, we've got to bring the lad down to Egypt. And Jacob said, he's not going, he's not, you're not taking the lad. The lad had ten children. He was probably at least 30 years old. You know, or at least in his upper uh, upper uh, 20s, probably 30. Um, but they called him a lad, right? But he was a grown man with a big family. He had more than anybody. Benjamin had ten, ten sons. And then the sons of Bilhah. Uh, Dan, Naphtali, total seven. So this is a list of 12 sons, one daughter, 52 grandchildren, and four great-grandsons, uh, with Dan with a few, uh, a few sons, and Benjamin with the largest number of 10. So the total here is 70. I think we'll just stop there instead of trying to uh, go pronounce all these names, which I'm not really good at. And so let's come down to verse number 27. It says, The sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls, all the souls of his house of Jacob, which came into Egypt were three score and ten, so seventy souls. Of course, there were other people there as well, uh, daughters-in-law and daughters as well. So he left home at seventy-seven, and now he's one hundred and thirty, and he has seventy plus souls to his family. I think God did bless him and multiply him, and what that was the promise, wasn't it? The Abraham and his seed that God would bless, and a seed one day would be as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea. All right, well, that's, uh, that's Jacob's family, Jacob's faith. Now look at Jacob's favorites in verse 28 to verse 30. And this is, this is a good wee bit right here. So in verse 28, And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Next week we're going to show you a map of where that, where that all is. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father. Now, I, I said this before, but when I started reading through the stories of New Christian, I thought to myself, you know, Joseph has got all this power. He knows where his daddy lives. Now, why doesn't he just saddle up a horse and say to old Pharaoh, I'm going to be back in a week. I've got some family business to attend. I think Pharaoh would have been good with that. I mean, Pharaoh was happy with Joseph. And Joseph could have done that. He says, I've got my horse. I've got some riders with me. And we're going to go off. I'll be back in, in a week. And he could have went home to find out if his daddy was still alive. To find out where his brothers were. Oh, my. That could have been a whole different story. But, you know, he wasn't. Joseph was interested in the will of God. And he was very careful about everything that he planned. And he, he, he kind of knew they were going to come because he was the only person who had food. He knew they were going to come down. There was probably you know, thousands and thousands of people coming down. But he was kind of looking for, uh, especially the Canaanites who were coming down from the, the land of Canaan. And one day he saw them. Now they didn't know him, but he knew them. And so then he, and it's an amazing thing, but he starts to concoct and um, put together this whole story about getting Benjamin down and then holding on to Benjamin to see what they do. Would they, are they going to put their daddy through this again? Because he said, now you can, go on, you can go on home, but Benjamin has to stay here. And they could have went on home and broke their dad's heart again. Or they could have repented, which means they're going to do something different this time. They had to live over again. They got it wrong with Joseph. Boy, they learned a lesson. Anytime Joseph's name come up, and family and the meetings it probably never came up. They all had sheepies looks on their faces. Talk about a skeleton in the closet. But anyway, Joseph um, set this thing, set it all up so that they could be brought into the same situation they were with their brother, with, with himself, only now concerning Benjamin. And they basically 
<clears throat> said, we're not going home. We're not leaving anybody. And old Judah says, you keep me as your slave, but Benjamin's got to go home. I will stay in his place. Isn't that wonderful? That's what Jesus did for us. And that was a true sign of true repentance. And that's when Joseph broke down, started crying. He says, and Joseph, and he made everything right because they had met the standard of repentance. They changed everything. And so... Joseph made ready his chariot. He knew that if he circumvented God and did his own thing to go see his daddy and to get after his brothers, it could have messed everything up and it would have messed everything up. So he was wise and he waited on God and he, he wanted to see them get right. And once they got right, that, now he's able to be reconciled with them. Of course, last time they, he hugged their neck, he wept on them. They knew, after, and that, that's when his, his brothers responded and they spoke to him after they could feel his real tears on their neck, knowing that Joseph really did love them. He really had forgiven them and true reconciliation had taken place. Beautiful, beautiful moment. But now his daddy wasn't there. So now we have this wonderful story when he meets his daddy. So he gets his chariot ready. Now his daddy's coming down. He's, he's ready made his journey down. And we'll talk about Judy here in a minute. But he's on his way down. And so uh, Joseph is getting his chariot ready and went up. Now, let's just look at this. Let's just enjoy this, this verse. And so Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen. Okay, so Joseph is not in Goshen. Goshen is up in the north, uh, the, the Nile Delta, where all the green grass was. Um, what do you call the My Pillow guy, where he makes the sheets, right? Well, Goshen, that's what he gets. He says, this is where this, this uh, cotton comes from in Egypt. This Egyptian cotton from Goshen, I think he said. But anyway, um, that's, that's where it was. To Goshen and presented himself to, unto him. Now, the old uh, Joseph doesn't walk up like he's the, the big cheese. He comes up and he presents in humility. He presents himself to his father. Now, watch this bit. And he fell on his neck. I mean, he, he hugged him. He put, his, he put his neck on his neck and he wept on his neck a good way. I can imagine that. Words weren't sufficient. Amen. Amen. They just hugged and embraced and cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And stood there and cried and cried and cried. No words were exchanged. He wept on his neck a good way. And then Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die since I've seen thy face because thou art yet alive. See, Joseph didn't really know what his daddy, what, I mean, why didn't his daddy come looking for him? He didn't know that until his brothers were telling, spilling the beans and telling the story. It's too warm in here, isn't it? I see a fan. No, I thought it was too cold in here earlier, so I, I bumped it up a wee bit. I'm trying to keep you happy, you know, I'm trying to keep you happy. Okay, so let's look at point three here. Through this story, there are two men that come to the fore. Joseph, of course, who we know to be the favourite, but also Judah. Look back at verse 28. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph. And they stopped there. Wait a minute, what happened to Reuben? Reuben's the eldest. Why doesn't Jacob or Israel send the eldest down to Egypt to sort things out, get things ready? Why doesn't he send Simeon? Why doesn't he send Levi? All ahead, all, all older than Judah. No, here's what happens. Through this story, because of Judah. Remember, who was it that spoke up and repented on behalf of all of the brothers? It was Judah. He was the one that sold him, so he was going to stand up. And he was the one that did the repenting. He's the one that started telling his daddy, listen, uh, if, if, if you don't see Benjamin, you're not going to see me because I'm going to, stay, I'm, I'm going to be a pledge for him. That's why he said to Joseph, um, I'll be your slave, but Benjamin has to go home. So Judah comes to the fore now. And Judah now becomes the leader. And that's why you call Israelites Jews. Jews comes from the name Judah. Judah. And Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, taken into captivity by Babylon from when the time of the return, they were called Jews from basically from that time on. So we call them Jews. But as for Judah, because Judah's the leader. And you're going to find out when, uh, in Genesis 49, when Jacob pronounces these prophecies on his sons, that Judah gets a good report. Even Judah had done really, really bad stuff. And yet it's not even mentioned. And he says, a lawgiver shall not depart from between Judah's feet until Shiloh come, and on the him shall the gathering of the people be. And what that means is, all the kings are going to come out of Judah, and most importantly, the Messiah, the Shiloh, the rest giver, will come from Judah. You know, the Bible prophesies long before Jesus was born, he would come of the family of David, he would come of the tribe of Judah. 
It tells you he would be virgin born. It tells you when he would come in Daniel chapter 9. It tells you how he would come. Um, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. We had a Jewish person here um, for Easter. And uh, Davis has brought their, most, a lot of their family. And, uh, and they told me it was coming. So, I mean, Lord help you. But that, that whole message was for him. Sorry. It just was. Because I love the Jewish people. And I'll do every to the Jew first. The gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so, I, I'm sorry, I just couldn't help myself. So we had Jesus, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection from the Old Testament. And I love preaching it. And I preach in such a way where I wanted to get the guy's attention. And so the word has come back. Uh, Brother Ed was telling me the other day. He, says that he said, uh, you know, that was the only church I'd ever been in where I didn't feel like, how did he put it? Didn't feel like he wasn't offended. And so I'm hoping that some of the things, because we talked about Joseph and Moses and all that, and hopefully some of that will, those seeds will stick, you know. Um, but Judah is the fourth oldest, yet he is the one who leads the others. And so two favorites come to the fore here, Judah and Joseph. And when we get, in fact, let's go ahead and turn to Genesis 40, 49, and we'll see this. So here you have these prophecies about Jesus, you know, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And that's what I was going to say about our friend, our Jewish friend, was Ed had said the only problem he has was, was with the virgin birth. And I thought, that's easy. Isaiah 7, 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive in birth. That's, that's Old Testament. That's said in chapter 7 of Isaiah, verse 14, that the Messiah would come, that God would give them a sign. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a sign for a young woman to have a child, but it is a sign for a, a woman who has never known a man, a virgin, to have a child, you know. And so he needs you to understand that's in his Bible, right? Okay, so um, Genesis 49 and again, uh, see, he, he talks about Reuben first. Starts with the eldest, works his way down. Verse 3 and 4, he's talking about Reuben. Unstable as water, shall th thou shalt not excel. Negative. Simeon and Levi. Cruelty are in their habitations. Verse 5. Negative. Comes to verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. The word Judah means praise. Leah was praising the Lord. The God had given her a third son. His name is called Praise. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Ooh. Because he's been about Jesus here. He's going to bow down before Christ when he comes. The, the whole Jewish nation will bow down before him. Just as they did Joseph. You see, both Judah and Joseph are types of the Lord. In verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. That's a young, that's a pup. That's a, land, that's a, 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 a lion's a cub. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down and couched as a lamb, as an old lamb. Now, wait a minute, he's a young lamb, he's a cub, and now he's an old lamb. Who shall raise him up? You see, we have two pictures of Jesus there in his, in his first coming and the second coming. He comes as, uh, in his mission as the, uh, as the lamb of the tribe of Judah, but he's coming as the lamb's whelp. But then, after long time, he couched as a lamb, as an old lamb. Who shall raise him up? And it's almost like the lion is sleeping. But one day the lion is going to wake. And when Jesus comes again, he's not coming as a pup. He's coming as a mature lion and he's going to devour. Verse 16, or sorry, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a log ever from between his feet, until Shiloh, the rest giver, come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That didn't happen the first time. They didn't gather to Jesus. The nation didn't receive him. But they will one day. Remember Jesus come uh, on the donkey, binding, verse 11, binding his foal onto the vine and his ass's coat onto the, the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his blood, clothes in the blood of grapes. There's two things there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm off on a rabbit trail right now. <clears throat> but Isaiah chapter 61 talks about who is this that comes from Basra with his, his garments stained. Uh, and he talks about how he treads the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Isaiah 61, Revelation chapter 19. So when he came the first time, his blood was his, his, his clothes were soaked in his own blood. But when he comes the second time, that's the blood of his enemies. That's the blood of the wine press spattered up on, on his garments. His waist, his garments and wine, his clothes and the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. 
And so here's a wonderful prophecy of Judah about being the leader. About he's the father of kings and really the father of Shiloh, the Messiah. And then I want to look down. Uh, let's see. Just let's look at Joseph. Look at verse 22. This is Joseph. These are the favorites, okay? Jacob's favorites, Judah and Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful, this is what Jacob says about Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. Now I want you to think about this. Because here's, here's a garden, and in the garden is a well, and by the well is a tree. And of course the roots are going down, and he's getting his own source. It's amazing how Joseph survived um, in fact, he goes on to say um, in verse 23, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. That's talking about his brothers. And that's also talking about Jesus. But what he's talking about, he's like a tree. He's like a branch, the fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. So here's you've got a garden and a wall. And in, inside that garden is Israel. He's speaking about his own people. That's where he's from. But on the other side of the wall are the Gentiles. And Joseph's ministry was primarily, it was both, but really primarily to the Gentiles because the bow of the tree didn't just stay within the wall. The bow of the tree went over the wall and dropped the fruit to the Gentiles on the other side of the wall. So he, he didn't just help his own people, he helped people on the outside, right? His bow, uh, that's what he says, a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall. So Joseph didn't just help his own people, he helped the Egyptians, the Gentiles, and really any other nation that came. But you know, that's just like Jesus, isn't it? He came unto his own, his own received him not, but his many has received him. Jesus runs, runs beyond the wall too. He, did, he didn't just come to Israel, he's for the world, he's the saviour of the world. And it's interesting, verse 24, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Joseph was strengthened by the Lord. And then it says, uh, the mighty God of Jacob, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And I think that's speaking about Jesus. From the, God, from the God of Jacob, from thence, from him, from the God of Jacob is the shepherd. That's Jesus, the good shepherd and the stone of Israel. Jesus many times is called the stone. And if a man will fall on that stone, he will be broken, but he'll be saved. But if he rejects it and the stone falls on him, then he'll be completely crushed and destroyed. Jesus is the stone, he is the rock of God. So that's an amazing thing. And so these, both of these favorites of Jacob, I think, uh, really do typify and pattern for us uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and here's another, this is not in your notes, but I think this is really interesting. Um, so here's what I want to say. Okay, so in verse 28, he sent Judah before him on the Joseph. Now, oh, Jacob's an old man, right? Uh, Pharaoh sent them wagons or litters. These are basically bed that can be on wheels. But they're basically for older people or younger people who can't walk or ride. So they've got to sit in, in the van, right? They've got to sit in the carriage. And so Jacob was coming, and you know they're going to go a lot slower. Old Judah's probably either walking or on a donkey or something. He's down the road. He's, getting, he's going to Joseph to get things organized. For all the people coming down. And so Jacob's probably in the back as an old man in this wagon. And coming following after. So he's not going to get there the same time Judah's getting there. Now when did Judah come to Egypt? Do we know that? We did see this. I thought this was really interesting. Because what you're looking at. This is when Jacob realizes that his son is alive. This is when Israel realizes that the guy he thought was dead for 20 years is not actually dead. He's, he's really alive. So this is almost like a, a picture of the resurrection. And almost like if Joseph is a picture of Jesus, which he is, then Jacob understanding his life is like a picture of the resurrection. But when did it happen? Look over at uh, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And of course, we, especially this year, Good Friday was the beginning of Passover. And I always make the point, why is it that Passover and Easter is always at the same time? It's because Jesus died on the Passover. He is the Passover. He died on the 14th of Nisan. Now, when did Judah go down to Egypt? Because the point here is made by Moses in Exodus 12 and verse 41. Look at this. Look at verse 40. Now, the sore journeying of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt for, was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end 
of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now what he's saying is this, it was 430 years that they were in Egypt to the day. To the day. The day that, the day that Judah went down is the same day that the Israelites were coming out 430 years, the exact same day. So when, when did they come out? Okay, well, that was on the night of the 14th of, of, of Nisan. Now, you'll notice uh, on Good Friday or Passover, Passover is always on what they call a, a new moon. Um, or not the new moon, but the full moon. There's a full moon at Passover. I don't know if you remember that. I went outside and looked at the full moon at Easter, at Passover. Um, and so that explains when they came to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, how they could see one another. You always see them with torches. Well, it was a full moon that night. Um, when they, they went out in the Exodus, it was a full moon. They went out at night. When they crossed through the Red Sea, which would have been some days later, that was at night, but there was still a full moon. They crossed the Red Sea at night. It was early in the morning when God closed the sea over. So even though there was, there was a fire pillar of fire to, to give them light, but that was primarily a defensive thing. But they could see from the new moon. Uh, the point is that they went out on the 14th of Nisan. So that was when Reuben went down. Reuben went into the land of Egypt on the 14th of Nisan, which is our April, March, April time. Now he went down and he, his daddy came, I don't think the same day, do you? If he's in a wagon dragging behind, now, I'm, I'm, I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it. But give me a little bit of liberty. <laughs> Say Reuben gets down the first day, and that's him. I'm sorry, Judah, Judah, thank you. Judah comes the first day, makes himself known to Joseph, and Joseph then says, Right, I'm going to go meet my daddy. So he gets a, so, so the next day he's going out to, re, to, to meet his daddy. And maybe, and I just kind of figure it's on the third day. All right, just give me a little bit of license, a little bit of imagination. So when Jacob, and he sees Joseph coming, and he sees him for the first time in 22 years, and, he's, and what does he say? He says, let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. Jacob, Israel, sees that Joseph is alive. When does he see him? On the third day of Passover. Passover is not even a thing here. But it's the same day of the week when Jesus was resurrected on the third day, the Feast of First Fruits, which that year was on the third day. I, you know, you can take that for what it's worth. But I just think that's kind of cool because this is a picture of the, the resurrection. You know, the Jews one day are going to realize that Easter is real because they're going to see Jesus alive. The, the, the person they thought was dead for 2,000 years is actually alive, just like Jacob, Israel here. The guy that he imagined and thought was dead, he saw his clothes stained in blood, the coat of many colors. Joseph, my son, is dead. But he really wasn't. And Israel one day is going to find out that Jesus, who they rejected for all these years, is not really dead. He was dead for three days, but he's alive forevermore. So Jacob's favorites. And then lastly, Jacob's flocks. Look at verse 31 through 34. Um, <clears throat> and Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh. I just kind of think this is cool too, because after the, the resurrection of Jesus, you know, 40 days he showed himself alive by many infallible priests. And then what happened? He went up. <laughs> and Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up. <laughs> now he's not going to heaven, but he's going to go up. And show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds. So here's what's going on. You see, Joseph knows Pharaoh. Joseph has, has access to Pharaoh. Joseph knows what Pharaoh wants. And maybe his daddy doesn't really know all the ins and outs of the court of Pharaoh and what Pharaoh is expecting. And so really Joseph is the go-between. He's the mediator between his family and Pharaoh. And he, he, he wants everything to, be, to go really smoothly. No, he doesn't want Pharaoh to be upset. He doesn't want his family to be um, in any way mistreated. And so he says, now, I'm going to go up to Pharaoh, and I'm going to tell him that you're coming. Now, when you meet Pharaoh, this is what you have to say to him. So he instructs his daddy, instructs his brother. Now, this is how we're going to do this. He's the mediator, because he knows how to make this thing work really smoothly. So Pharaoh's happy, and his family's happy. By the way, Jesus, when he went up, that's what he's doing right now. 
He's the media. There's one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. And he knows what the Father expects. And he knows what we are. And he is the link pin, pin, but he is both God and man. He's the link pin between a holy God and a sinful, a sinful man. And he's able to do the mediation and to work it out so that when, when, it, when, when we meet and every, everything is perfect and God is happy. And he is our mediator and our high priest. But in verse uh, 32... He says, uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, verse 31, this is what he's going to say to Pharaoh. I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which are in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, he's coaching them what to say. Here's what you're going to say. Thy servants trade hath been about cattle from our youth, and even until now, both we and also our fathers, that we may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now, what is going on there? I'll tell you what's going on. He knows that his family are going to be in Egypt, but they shouldn't be of Egypt. He's going to make sure that they have the best of the land, which is the fertile crescent where the Nile River comes down and you get all these green pastures everywhere to feed all their flocks. But also the shepherds, the cattlemen are an abomination to the Egyptians. We talked about that when they, when they were eating together. The Egyptians wouldn't eat with the Hebrews because that is an abomination. Here's what abomination means. That's what abomination means. When God says homosexual, homosexuality is abomination, that's what he means. It makes me sick. That's why you see, and I said, we, we, we don't even have cable TV anymore. We have a, a terrestrial aerial <laughs> that's in my attic. Believe it or not, you can get good, you can get good reception unless it's raining. Um, and it's free, absolutely free. We get like, I don't know, seven or eight channels from Cookville, from Murfreesboro. And half the time we don't even watch it. But the times I did watch it, and you see the, all these different companies, and they have like two men, and it's always very subtle how to do it. You know, is that a man or a woman? It's two men, and they're about to embrace or about to kiss, and you're going, Well, oh, Pastor, you shouldn't say that because, you know, we've got to be all inclusive. No, no, it's, it's an abomination, okay? All right, so come and take me away to jail. That's the truth, okay? But they're bringing it in, you see, and they're trying to uh, desensitize, and it's working. Desensitizing in our whole population. Um, but anyway, so, the, so when the Egyptians think about cattlemen, maybe they think of the smell of the animals or something, but they're like, you know, they're townies. Egyptians are townies. They're not country people. They don't like cattlemen. They don't like farms. They don't like shepherds. You know, they don't know what they're going to eat, but uh, they don't like that. So J Joseph says this now. Say that you're shepherds. And that means that they're going to be in Egypt, but they're going to be separated from the Egyptians. They're going to be separate. That means that they're not going to intermarry. They're going to keep their own identity in the land. They're in Egypt, but they're not of Egypt. And Joseph was smart enough to think about that, to set it up so that when his family came in, they got the best of, they got the best of the land, yet they would not be contaminated with the world. Egypt is a type of the world. Yeah. You know, as a believer, you're to be in the world, but not of the world. Right. We are not to be like the world. We're not to be assimilated. And we should be separate from the world. Come out from among you and among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. That's a biblical doctrine, which is unheard of anymore, it seems like. But we're not to be of this world. And Joseph was smart enough to set that up. They would be separate from the Egyptian culture. And they would be considered sojourners, which is, means that they're pilgrims passing through, which they were. I don't know if they... Uh, well, if they, you know, you know, the, the, Genesis wasn't written yet, okay? Moses wrote Genesis, so they didn't have the Bible at this point. So unless they remember what God told Abraham, that they would be there for 400 years, 430 years, uh, they wouldn't have known how long they were going to be there. Um, maybe them, some of them would have been shocked. But they really were pilgrims because that was not their home. God had a land for them, and they would move to that land with Moses later on. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you for your patience. Lord, thank you for your precious word to me. We've enjoyed our study. It seems like, Lord, when we read this scripture, these, these stories, we just get immersed in it. It's almost like we're there. And it, it feeds us. And we're in good company. Men like Joseph and Jacob. 
We're thankful, Lord, for these wonderful patriarchs and the principles that teach us these things and our relationship with the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Lord, we love the Jewish people. Our hearts break for them because they know not the one they have rejected. But Lord, as we said this morning, the worst is yet to come for them. But thankfully, Lord, one day they will say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they will receive you as they received Joseph, as they received Moses. And Lord, you will be their deliverer. And we will be there to witness it. We will come with you, Revelation 19. And we come as the bride. And Lord, we're grateful for that grand reunion one day. We're reminded, Lord, of Jacob and Joseph being reunited with tears. One day, Lord, there's going to be a glorious, wonderful reunion that we will have with Jesus, but also our loved ones who have gone on before us. And Lord, we have learned to live without them, but one day we will see them and we will kiss them and hug them physically in their, our glorified bodies, our physical bodies. Uh, Lord, we will know each other. We will recognize each other. It will all be joy with no admixture of sorrow. And Lord, to be parted no more forever. Lord, what wonderful promises you have given us in your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for what we have heard and learned tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.